welcome everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay. So this talk, our second talk for the day, is called The Glory of Blaze, and we have three fantastic artists beside me, Adam Cox, Alexandra Copeland, and Trevor Smith. And they, as, as with all the other speakers, they have a stall here as well, and you'll be able to go and see their work um, in the flesh as well. My name's Jane Sawyer. I run Slow Clay Centre, which is on the other side of this tent, and I'm uh, very pleased to have you here today. We um, would like to pay our respects to the original, the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land we run this wonderful event on. And also just to have, to be grateful that we are able to run events like this with all the madness happening in the world at the moment. On to Adam, um, who is our first speaker. So Adam completed a Bachelor of Arts um, and began the long, exciting journey to becoming a studio potter. He endeavours to express a love of clay through a variety of unique and artistic ceramic pieces, incorporating both wheel thrown and hand building techniques. Over the past three decades, he's experienced with a range of decorating his fire and firing techniques, including electric, gas, wood and raku firing. A great deal of his work has been created through hand painting and drawing, slip trailing and carving, and much of which is heavily influenced by his love of Asian pottery. A little over 10 years ago, he decided to delve into the fascinating, intriguing and always challenging art of crystalline glazes. He was amazed by the chemi chemistry and the technical precision and focus required by this glaze, whilst at the same time realising how random the results can be. So, I'd like to introduce Adam to speak about this more. Don't be put off if you feel like it's a bit technical. Even though this panel is about glazes, um, you can always say, ah, what does that mean? And, we'll, and Adam will explain and the people will explain. But thank you, Adam, for, for agreeing to speak. Over to you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome to Ten Talks, everybody. Um, this is actually my first Ten Talk, so if I uh, ramble a little bit, I'll, I'll apologise. Um, yeah, when Jane contacted me to do this, I remembered last year that uh, Ted Second was actually here talking about crystalline glazes, so I sort of thought, oh, there's no, no pressure at all there. <laughs> but, um, no, he was talking so about the IAC. Oh, okay, okay. It ha happened to slip yeah. it in, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so I predominantly work with um, crystalline glazes, but um, I'll just very briefly go over sort of what, I guess, what led me to that. Um, originally, I, I hired a studio space um, in Yanav, a um, little, little, little town um, in the Trobe Valley, where um, I worked at the Art Resource Collective, um, which was just a, an old butter factory in a series of um, rooms that were just um, set up for artists and potters. And I was lucky enough to have a studio space next to a potter named Ino Kiyoshi, who was just an incredible, incredible potter that had skills I'd, I had just never seen anything like before. And he would make bowls that were just paper, paper thin and beautiful glazes and just very, very inspiring potter, which influenced, I think, a lot of my earlier forms and bowls, um, even though I'd, I'd turn a, a foot. And if, I also had a, a passion for painting and drawing and wanted to, I guess, combine that with, um, with a love of clay, and which is always a bit of a challenge because it's never quite, what, what you paint never quite comes out exactly the way you fire and it's always a little bit of a challenge to sort of combine the two. But um, I played a lot with a few different techniques and I've, that's why I've got this image here today. That's was fairly indicative of what I used to do and still would very much like to get back into. This was actually a photo of a pot I had here last year. So really, it's something I really do enjoy doing. But I, I was at a point where I had a lot of uh, potter friends that were telling me about all these wonderful um, glazes running down pots and things with different viscosity blending together and carbon trapping. Um, iron coming through and all sorts of beautiful random random things that you had a lot less control over and I just sort of thought it was uh, there was an area that I was just missing out on a little bit and I, I wasn't looking to, re to replace my decorating, my painting, I just wanted a bit of a different path, something that might take me out of my comfort zone a little bit. So 
I, I had a, a bit of a go at a, a, a few different things and uh, copper reds for a little while and realised very quickly that copper reds aren't something you'd have a quick go at. <laughs> no, no, they're uh, so not, not too much like there, but um, another thing I'd like to get back to, there's just not enough, uh, not enough hours in the day or not, not enough years. When I went to my first pottery expo, we used to have these at um, Federation Square years ago and I was just like a child in a, in a toy store really, just all these amazing potters everywhere and incredible work and I think so many areas I could have gone off into and enjoyed, enjoyed. Um, but I saw a stand at the front of the entrance of Federation Square and it was just eyes meeting across the room, or eyes to pots I should say, there was a display of uh, an amazing potter named John Strumer who is here today and his his work just it blew me away it just it just got got hold of me and it was it was the glazes it was the forms it was just it was everything about it and the, dis the display and john john's a john's a great guy to talk to and I had a little bit of a chat I, I didn't quite have the courage to play john with too many questions on the on the day but um i've sort of um john's become quite a, a good friend of mine in future years but um, so yeah, so I, I basically went home and read everything I could about crystalline glazes, um, uh, the, the technique of uh, going to a higher temperature, the glazes virtually running down the pot onto a catcher, and you're holding at a mid temperature where the actual crystals form. But I, I actually found the, the sort of the science and chemistry side of it was really interesting too. Where I, I read a little bit about um, ionic bonding. If there's any chemistry people, I'm sorry if I've got this topsy turvy, but. Um, the way the, the, the ionic bonding in the um, in the glaze, it's essentially uh, zinc and silica that are seeding the crystal. So um, you have um, uh, ions shedding electrons basically, and they become positive and the reverse for the silica. So the the zinc um, very basically just it acts as a seed. It's like a, it's a, a nucleus, but it just acts as a seed where glass particles actually attach to, and that's that's um, simplified sort of version of what where the, the actual crystal starts to form. So I thought on the on the other side of that, I just I've got to give it a go. So I made a whole lot of tests, found some just some recipes online, and applied them to my tests. Fired up, and I, I wasn't really expecting too much because I knew this glaze was notoriously um, notoriously difficult to get right. So I fired, opened my kiln, and to my surprise, I had tests covered in beautiful crystals. And and I sort of thought, oh, this is. I got a bit overconfident. I thought this is pretty easy. Like what? <laughs> What, what are people going on about? This is, I've, I've cracked it first off. So I thought, oh, people just, they're not, they're not focusing enough. They're not concentrating on the kiln schedules, you know. They mustn't be, I've, I've, I've got this. So I then got some larger pots, covered them with the same glazes, same firing cycle. And I thought, and I had to drop some pieces off to a gallery that week. So I thought, oh, this is great. I'll take my new crystal pots with me. So I opened the kiln and unfortunately um, not, not, I'd say probably the ugliest pots that I think I've ever opened a kiln door to. <laughs> they were just lumpy and grey and bits of glaze had fallen off one side and on the, on the kiln shelf. So um, I was, I was, my ego was brought right back down to earth um, and realised, I guess my first lesson in crystalline pottery was that what works on something this big doesn't necessarily work on a bigger feast, which applies to a lot of glazes, so I'm not quite sure why it surprised me. But, but from there, I just, yeah, I, I just, I fired and fired and continued to read everything I could about crystalline glazes. And um, if I think of the next slide, this is one of the earliest. Um, this was just probably the, some of the earliest crystals where I, because I just, I threw away pot after pot as you do. But I got to a point where I found um, my temperatures and glaze thickness, where I just started to get the crystals to form. Nothing much in the background, but I was at least getting that, that nucleation uh, happening and I was just amazed at how many different things could actually affect the result or sort of glaze thickness you could fire up a little bit too quickly or too long and have alumina leaching out of the clay that affected it um, um, application sprayed painted it so many things um, apart from the recipe affected the uh, the way that it uh, worked so yeah in time I just started to um, and just it's just trial and error there's really nothing else um, started to get a bit more magic happening in the background, a bit more um, in the background. So, so the titanium actually seeds and causes things in the background as well. And that's actually the same glaze that was on the other pot. It's just different holes, different temperatures, um, having it run down a little bit more on the pot. And you can see um, 
also I drop to about uh, around 1080 degrees and it starts the, the central sort of crystal and then I sort of move up and down and even as you're dropping even down 900 degrees, even lower, there's still things kind of forming as you, as you progress down. And of course the, the results are always, it can still go wrong uh, very, very easily. That last one was manganese dioxide, this is uh, copper carbonate. And the other thing that I discovered too was that uh, different carbonates, oxides, colours, it wasn't quite as simple as just having a base and whatever colour I want, if I wanted green, put in copper, if I want a blue, put in cobalt. The, the actual, because the, the carbonates and oxides, the, the, the colourants in it, actually affect the, the fluxing or the, the movement and the viscosity of the, of the glaze flow, so that can, and the, the shape of the crystal can change quite dramatically. So it all, it all um, yeah, all, all affected the, the pot, but it was just once again, just, just trial and error. And this is a, uh, another, a little bit of uh, iron in the background. Um, but I also wondered why so many crystal pots had this kind of, t sort of a, a teardrop and long neck kind of effect, but it was just any, any sort of interruption of the flow of the glaze uh, changes the nucleation of the crystals quite a bit. So yeah, so this one, you can see where just that slight, where it's a bit more horizontal, it, it changes sort of what they do completely as opposed to flowing down the, the pot. And it's, these are, if you're going to get into crystalline glazing, um, be ready to go through a few kiln shelves as well, because they tend to, um, they, they really, uh, after a while you work out the glaze flow and how much is going to land in the, um, in the, 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 the catcher below. But um, it amazed me, um, this one, that, um, I've taken a few photos outside, uh, it amazed me this, different light, um, which Ted, uh, when Ted Second was here last year, he was talking about a pot of his that was a, um, I think it was based on, on bismuth and um, uh, manganese dioxide saturation, a few, but it was almost metallic and he was saying how it goes in iridescent green when it's out in the sunlight. And the, yeah, the, the sun just changes, because this is the same glaze as the other ones, but the sunlight just completely really changes what, um, sort of the way the light reflects off the crystals and the, and the background, which, which interested me as well. So, that's it, yes, that's a little, so that's what's actually un underneath the pot when you fire them. Um, so the glaze runs down, catches in the, in, in the little catcher, and then you chip that off afterwards and you're sort of grinding back with a, a, um, a diamond tool. So there's a bit of, bit of process in it, but um, this, this one's a cobalt with a little bit of iron and it's actually an acid dip. It was another technique I've got into a little bit um, recently where um, it comes out a little, a little duller, a little darker, but it's in a, just a very mild acid, um, it's just a full pH um, controller actually, but it just, yeah, it, it just eats, even in about an hour, it just sort of eats into the crystal a little bit more and the metals just draw out a little bit more. And uh, change can, some can change quite dramatically. The backgrounds can even go sort of white and matte if they're in the acid for long enough. Oh no, it's all—it's actually all fired. Uh, like it comes out of the kiln. Yes, yeah, and then it's just dunked in a bucket for bucket of um, acid. I, I used to do it in pure sulfuric acid, but I thought I didn't really like the idea of having buckets of sulfuric acid around the place. So I thought this is a bit more, a bit safer. This is actually just a clear crystal, a little bit of titanium um, over a uh, cobalt. Um, slip underneath which just the cobalt just crawls through a little bit which is just a way of uh, getting a bit more of a subtle effect on the glaze something else but it's interesting when that's um, when that slip sprayed on it, it makes a quite a rough texture so it, all of the nucleating points you, you create a lot more and you can get over nucleation of crystals again which can be a, a, a bit of an issue but um, I was that's uh, with um, platters and things too because you're not getting as much run you Quite often, the glaze, glaze chemistry for flat things has to be quite uh, quite different, quite different holes. But um, and you're also running into the centre too. So it's sort of um, if you fill up the base, then the expansion of because it's a very crystalline glazes are have got a very high expansion fit in them. So they they expand and contract um, before and after firing quite a quite a bit. But um, but yeah, no, that's a, that's another challenge as well. And I'll um, actually just I'll, something I'll get very briefly. Just to show you, no matter how long you do this, it can still uh, get get issues. Um, so this is a similar, so this is an acid dip one, similar to the one that I had there. And I, so I had that, I got that out of the kiln thinking, looking at the front, thinking, oh, that's that's great, you're a beautiful pot, I'll take that, and then turned it around. And it's all, uh, <laughs> so there's, all, there's, there's always something, something else to resolve. Gen generally crawling happens when you've got, if the pot's a bit dirty or it's got, you haven't, clean the dust, it's, it separates the, well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. 
<laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't quite bond. But and I and I found I was yeah. Oh, well, I put I put it out. <laughs> well, well, it's, <laughs> well, it's funny. I came here. This um, first thing I did was I got that out, and it's, I ran up to John. Like John, look what's what's wrong with this. <laughs> had a good had a good chat, but um. Oh, he he loved all the interesting things in the background, and um, there was some, yeah, yeah, and there's a bit of irony sort of pattern that he was looking at too that he thought that was quite good. But, but uh, he thought I might have it a little thin, um, which it might have to just, but too too thick, and I don't get background detail, so it's a very fine balance. Um, so, but yes, anyway. Yeah, I, I generally have a, a secondary glaze underneath, which is heavy in um, titanium, which is quite quite white, um, sort of mats it out, so it tends to sort of run, which just it brings a bit of brightness through the crystal, I've found. So it just sort of runs off that and leaves a bit of white, but I, then I, I kind of like the gradation from light to light, from, from light to dark. It sort of brings a bit of interest to it. So this, this is something just quite recently. Um, this is a, a, a base of um, Ted Seccombs that I, I started with, and um, Ted's very generous with his information. He's very. He's, I, I hadn't met Ted um, before last year, so I had a great chat with him, and just very, yeah, very helpful. Very, said, yeah, I'm an open book. Call me if you need anything. He's yeah, lovely, lovely guy. So this is just yeah, just something there. It's the same as the um, the glossy uh, pots, but it just actually grows. It has. It's very heavy in barium, so it just grows microcrystals in the background, which mats. That's it out, but they're, I should have brought one with me. They're, they're interesting to touch because they look sort of dry and rough, but they're, they're almost as smooth as the glossies. They, they just, they're really, they're almost like marble to sort of touch them. John Strummer over here, if you have a look at his, um, after the talk, he's, he's got some wonderful reduction um, crystalline, which I haven't quite tried yet because it's, it's tricky. It has to be either be done on the way down or a post-production because um, the, the zinc goes rather volatile in a, in a reduced atmosphere, so it's, it's always tricky, but... Um, but yeah, I, I haven't had too much success with that yet. So, but this is yeah, just the last couple of years I've just been sort of working with with the mats and uh, just trying once again various various temperatures, various oxides, and it's kind of back to the drawing board a little bit because they behave they behave differently again. But, um, just a uh, copper copper carbonate with the, the same base. Um, it's it's interesting too when you. So I, I like the idea of sharing glazes and sharing knowledge because I found with this I started with Ted's base and then I just I tried different things and things that reduce the nucleation and and just got different different effects and it's and I always think if you keep things to yourself then it sort of you you end up losing the information and it's like I figure I've had people come up to me at the stand and sort of very kind of you know you know very nervously ask me oh could you give me a little bit of a clue about this glaze and I'm, I'm quite happy to hand over recipes because I really I, I don't believe in everything's a secret and I just I'd rather just share the knowledge and then then you know they'll they'll try something slightly different, add something slightly different that takes it off to another place, and I just think that's I mean any art form I think uh, I think it's sort of it's a very positive thing to do. So it's it's that's why I I like um, having it the, the same attitude. Uh, this is a manganese uh, dioxide, so the, the the crystal shapes are slightly different again. Um, as I was saying before, it just it affects the uh, the movement and the, the growth of the crystal. Same again, just trying a few. Um, Slightly uh, altered forms in, in this uh, this glaze, sort of carved. So I, I used to do a lot of carving in, into pots and, and more um, a little bit more sculptural, which I'd, I'd like to ideally combine that with the um, certainly the matte crystalline glaze, just a, a, a little bit more sculptural and altered form. I, I think it would be really interesting and affects where the runs um, runs happen and they they tend to over nucleate anywhere. You sort of have little grooves, so it's always an, another challenge. But it's it's something else I'd like to get into. But but that's yeah, that's a, that's about where I am at the moment. So, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. If um if anyone has one very quick question, while yeah, it's I've, I've tried a few different shapes, but it's yeah, any, it, generally the more it runs, the more interesting things you get, the more sort of nucleation you get, and if the glaze is if it doesn't move enough and it's too thick on the pot, it really limits the the crystal growth. Um, so I found very early on I was just basically putting it on too thick and I was getting very sort of half finished sort of spiny kind of ugly looking things and it wasn't wasn't developing into anything so that yeah the sort of the, the long teardrop sort of shapes they tend to um, allow a lot of, of flow and it's and it sort of suits I think it suits the type of glaze too but um, but we all we all try and play with something a bit different. <laughs>
Thank you for that. Um, we'll, thanks, Adam. That was so interesting. Um, I'd like to introduce Alexandra Copeland to you. Has been around ceramics longer than me, <laughs> but she's been, she's been a name that I've looked up to all my ceramic career, and it's just wonderful to have you with us, Alexandra. Alexandra grew up here in Warrandyte. Her parents were founder members of Potter's Cottage, if anyone remembers that. And as a child, she was encouraged to spend time in the studios of the, of the Potters. As a nine-year-old, she was invited to join an adult painting group. After doing year 12, she completed the dipl a diploma of film and television and worked for a while in the film industry. So it was inevitable that she would turn to ceramics eventually, combining it with painting and drawing and also using the myolica technique, which you might need to explain to people. Both the NGV and the NGA have acquired works from her exhibitions at Distal Fink Gallery and a lifetime of ceramics has followed. So could you join me in making Alexandra very welcome? Thank you. Why do you paint with glazes? The answer is because I'm obsessive and I'm a compulsive artist. It's actually very difficult. I keep numerous sketchbooks handy for a wide range of subject matter. Everything from insects to human foibles. Uh, there's an insect there for you. I have always loved the Italian myolica pots in the NGV. I used to go and look at them when I was a kid. Um, and I wanted to paint on pots. The local potters were all making what we call brown pots with using ten moku. I grew up here at Warrandyte with potters who made their own glazes. I needed to develop my personal palette of colours. I began experimenting with both com commercial glazes and homemade recipes based on traditional Italian myolica, which is... Um, this is my olica here on earthenware. Um, I needed to find a set of colours that all fired at the same temperature. I originally worked on my majolica on earthenware, but there were very few commercial glazes available to buy. We're talking about 50 years ago, so I, ha I just didn't have access to any commercial glazes. I gradually accumulated about eight colours that I felt were all suitable and all fired at the same temperature. And Arctic Halpin, a local potter, gave me advice and I used to ring him with naive questions uh, and he, he helped me tremendously. I later switched to reduction-fired stoneware. Painting with glazes is not easy. It looks easy, but it's not easy. The colours are not the same as the end result. I first draw onto the pot with a secret recipe. Uh, unlike you, I do have secret recipes. <laughs> and I call my secret recipe Witch's Brew. It's a black matte glaze that's easy. Uh, with If you've got a good enough paintbrush, you can draw with it. I then apply the glazes by dab, dab, dabbing. I, I like to think that they look as if they've been painted on, but actually you have to dab them on. It's very slow and sometimes tedious. Talking books and Radio National are a comfort. I adapt as I work, but I can't change the design once I have started. So I have to sort of psych myself into it before I do start. And... Um, one little trick that I have is that I often put runny glazes on the pot so that it melts at a different temperature. Uh, and I, it looks as if it's a fault, but I do that on purpose just to make the pots more interesting. I've got a lifelong habit of experimenting. I try to put a test, no matter how silly, into each kiln. My partner Lee Copeland did year 12 physics and chemistry and he's been a huge help because I, I work out things intuitively and then I ask him about the chemistry of, of the, that and um, between the two of us uh, he, he's been a huge help to me with the more technical side of working out how to use glazes. 
Um, I often think that a lot rides on personal behaviour. If you gave 10 cooks a recipe for a sponge cake, you'd get 10 different cakes, depending on the ovens used and how much the cooks mix their batter, etc. And it's the same with glaze recipes. People often ask me for glaze recipes. I know that they'll probably get a different result, but I usually say, stick around and I'll tell you on my deathbed. <laughs> The holy grail for stoneware potters is a reduced copper red and celadon is also another holy grail that the Chinese have mastered, of course. Um, these two have been part of my ongoing experimentation. They're both really too difficult and they're too difficult to get successfully in every kiln. So here's a secret. This is one of my secrets. I use a faux copper commercial red that looks like real copper red and after a lot of testing, years of testing, celadon, the celadon that I use a lot is a blue, green or grey that comes by putting, a, this is my own invention, I put a very thin layer of iron oxide on the pot and then I paint with a blue, green or grey, depending on what colour I want, um, glaze. And the wonderful thing about pottery is that uh, although people have been making pots for thousands of years, it's still possible to come up with your own invention and for potters are still coming up with new recipes. I now use a group of glazes that mimic natural vegetable dyes found in antique tribal rugs. I've sort of narrowed it down and I only use about a maximum of eight colours and they all fire at the same temperature which is 1300 degrees and are under reduction and they're not poisonous and they're dishwasher safe. Now the, the grasshopper one that was just there, and this, this is a cicada, um, they are very early works that I did in, in earthenware with Majolica. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the, those recipes were not commercial recipes. They were, they, I did a lot of research on Italian Majolica recipes, traditional recipes. Um, you put a you put a white tin glaze down onto the pot and then you paint into that. So, as I said before, um, it looks as if I've just painted really freely, but in fact, because the white tin glaze is powdery and absorbs the glaze very quickly, you have to actually dab it on and make it look as if it's painted on. So that, that big tile took me ages and ages to do. It was very tedious to do. This is another very early, uh, I think this was 1989. Uh, the green is a traditional maolica green. The yellow is a commercial glaze and this, I put red spots on it which was a commercial glaze. And that particular one, I I wanted to go to Japan and I wanted to find a gallery in Japan to sell my work. And I took this in my hand luggage and I just walked into galleries in, in Tokyo. And after going to about 20 or 30 galleries, I found one who liked it. And I ended up having eight exhibitions in Japan. Um, they, had a, they had a financial disaster in Japan and my gallery closed. But um, that, that, was, that got me into Japan. This one's another... I, I was lucky enough to go to Italy and work in a... Li There's a little town in Italy called Deruta where they've been making maiolica for about... I think they've been making it for about 700 years. And um, they have wonderful, wonderful throwers there who can throw... There's, we don't have any throwers in, anywhere in Australia who can do what they do there. And This was a 65 centimetre in diameter platter 
that was thrown for me by a man called Roberto Domiziani, who's still working there. He's an old man now. And I chose this one to show you because you can see here the, the way the light's falling on it, that you can see where I've dabbed the glaze on. It looks, it looks as if it's just been painted on, but it was actually dab, 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 and it took me hours and hours to do it. As a result of um, doing all that dab, dab, dabbing, I ended up with really bad RSI in my right arm and hand. It was really, it's, it's agonizing when it gets really bad. So I had to give up working in earthenware and I changed over to working in stoneware, which is much easier on your hand and arm because the glazes melt into each other more happily. And that, that's one of my favorite pieces. It, it's a ha the hare and the tortoise. You have to be a tortoise if you're a potter, I think. This is a platter that I did in stoneware with, um, I called it batik. It's, a, it's like an Indonesian batik. I, it, again, it took me hours and hours to do it because I, um, I drew the design in with my witch's brew and then I coloured it all in. I, I painted in the colours and then I covered it all with wax. And you can see the wax on the... I, I overlapped it on, on the wax, with the wax. And then I painted the matte black's witch's brew over the top with a big brush. Uh, and luckily for me, it fired perfectly. Um, the, the wax melted perfectly and, um, and I was very happy with the result. But I haven't done very much work like that because it's just too tidy tedious and time consuming. In 2003, I'd always been aware of the town called Jingdezhen in China, because when you go to the NGV and you look at the Chinese pots, they often on the label, they say made in Jingdezhen. And that, that, the reason that for that is that the best porcelain clay in the world comes from that, from a mountain nearby. Uh, so in 2003 I went to Jingdezhen and I, I just had a bundle of paintbrushes and I, I had no introductions, no, no idea who, where, where I should go or what I should do. So I spent a few days wandering around looking at other artists' studios and there are quite a lot of, there are always a lot of foreign artists working there and some of the best Chinese artists from all over China come and work there. And um, I was sort of challenged. I was introduced to a very well-known Chinese potter called Lu Wei. And he, he gave me a platter and some cobalt blue. And he, he sort of gestured like that as if to say, prove yourself. <laughs> so I thought, I can't do anything vaguely Chinese because he'll be much better than me. <laughs> so I, um, there, was, there was another potter working there, so I did a portrait. So I, I ended up doing a whole sit. He very generously, he liked what I did, and he very generously offered me a studio space for six weeks. So I spent six weeks working and learning the ropes and learning how to, where the kiln was. I didn't even know where the kiln was at first and learning how the kiln operated and everything. And I did a series of portraits of other Chinese artists in, in blue. And, and at that stage in Jingdezhen, they were only working in blue and white. There was no colour. They, they did do um, enamel work, but, that, but no other coloured work. That's me trying to be taller than I really am. Uh, this is... This is what the pot looks like before it's fired. So there's no relation between the colours of the glazes and the colours that it eventually turns out to be. Um, sorry. Next. Um, this is a stoneware platter. It's a dancing female um, bowerbird. And it's got the fake celadon. And you can see I've put some tin maku around the edge to, to go runny, 
just to give it a bit of um, oomph and movement. Uh, this was a, um, a big pot that took me hours and hours to do and I'd, I'd done a test and got a copper red, copper turquoise but when it was fired you can see that that was all supposed to be turquoise in the background and it, it all went red in the kiln and I was absolutely devastated but I, I grew to really like it. Um, this is uh, the last two I'm just showing you. This is a, a rainbow trout and that's what it looked like before it was fired. So you can see that it looks very dull and um, you can't really tell what the colours are going to be and that sort of thing. And then the next one, um, it's not, not the same platter, but you can see that was, um, I put a, sprayed a coat of um, clear glaze over the coloured glazes and you end up with that result when it's fired. So um, just, just giving you an idea of what it looks like before and after firing it. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was so interesting. I think what we're trying to do with this panel is to give you a, a little insight into glazes that is so that are so different from each other. So the fact that Alexandra paints with glaze and you've had an insight into that is completely different from what you've heard with Adam with his crystalline glazes. Um, now we're going to move on to Trevor. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, and Trevor works with Shinog Glaze, and he'll explain to you a little bit more about all of that. I'll just get his slides up on the screen. But um, thank you very much, Alexandra. That was really wonderful. Thanks. So Trevor, just on 50 years ago, Trevor resigned from his secure job in, a Melbourne, in Melbourne and with his young family moved to the country. On the way, he brought, bought a potter's wheel and a five cubic foot gas kiln. He worked out how to throw, mix up a glaze, fire a pot and immediately started selling his work. Sounds like a dream, I'm true. Back then, the Mission Brown, like Mission Brown paint, chunky brown pots were in high demand. They lived exclusively off his work for 10 years before he decided to get some formal training. <laughs> he completed a graduate diploma studying under Oren Rye, Headley Potts and Kiyoshi Ino. So you've got great range there. He's now working exclusively with Shino Glazers. Please make him welcome. First, I wanted to say how fantastic their work is and their presentation was fantastic and the work was brilliant. And then I'm going to say perhaps you might be wondering how on earth you could ever get to that level. I'm like, it's an amazing level they've got to. But I'm here to tell you, give you a few words of encouragement, that, um, well, I've been making pots for 50 years, competitive, and for a lot of that time, I didn't know what the hell I, I was doing. I really didn't. And you might argue, some people do, that I still don't know what I'm doing. But, uh, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I found it doesn't matter. Just do what you love. And all these years later, I'm driven by perhaps memory, memories now of some glorious results that I perhaps flute along the way. And um, yeah, we'll go to the next slide. Now, I'm sort of going to quote Bob Dylan now because I was um, in the studio listening to music like I do. And uh, this track came on. And... Um, it seemed to just sort of hold what I was thinking in my head about today. And it ends with the word glory. And I thought, ah, I've got to use it. It's a glory glaze. So, is it? Yeah, I will at the end if the request is there. It's a long song, so don't request it. Now, the thing is, glory's jumped out. But the thing that jumped out at me was the name of the song and the first name in the song. And, um... I couldn't take my mind off that bit, and I, so the memories came flooding back about that as well. So, at first, I'm just going to go back a little bit. We're travelling back to 1975, and um, as you heard, I moved to country Victoria. Perhaps I won't say where it was. Um, we set up a studio, and I began working full time, and all that sounded good, except that the local count we, we set up a studio opposite the local council offices. And uh, we had done our homework, so we knew we could do it. Uh, but they didn't really sort of like the look of us. And they told us this. They thought we were communists. 
and if not communists, we were at least hippies. So, and there's an, and there was no way we were going to contaminate their obviously uncontam uncontaminated gene pool. No way, mate. We are not doing that. So, but we already had our own children. We weren't going to get involved in that. And so, um, yeah. So we go to the next slide, and uh, there we are. So. Communist. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but we perhaps did look a little scary, scary perhaps, and I thought perhaps we sort of look like ghosts from their colonial past that come back to haunt them. Yeah, so I could understand. Um, I'm not sure what they're afraid of, but um, the sort of thing they would say is like, you sort of, you better be here, you better be out of here by sundown, sundown fella. That sort of, you know, pull the gun out sort of deal. And, um, so, in 1975, in country Victoria, probably fairly equivalent to 1955 here in Melbourne. Pretty much about 20 years behind, behind the thing. Eventually, they started to sort of get used to me, and I could see they were sort of conceding something when they, uh, perhaps respect, perhaps not, when one of them said, you're not as silly as you look. And the thing about that sentence was, you know, we've all heard it, but this was just said in a non cliched sort of way. It was just a normal sentence. And that's sort of what got to me the most. It was like, yeah, yo, he isn't. Anyway, um, in the early 1980s, I was working away at the wheel sitting there. That's me. And I only ever had one photograph taken in perhaps 30 years. That's it. That's the one I used. Um, I was listening to the ABC radio and, and Parliament used to be on. I don't know why. I don't know if it interested me, but I did. And our local federal politician was up there talking. And um, he was in opposition, and so he didn't like the idea of a grant being given to this art, art resource collective in Yanar. Really didn't like it. I think it was about ten thousand dollars to set it up. And so he stood, he stood up, and this is where my mind went to the Dylan idiot line. Uh, he said this money had been given to artists, potters, and other idiots. So, artists, potters, and other idiots. Yep, we're all in the same group. And um, so, in the 1980s, this is the 80s now, we'll jump a decade, uh, artists, potters, and, and, and the like, right across Australia, were all considered idiots. And, um, and this was from a guy representing me in Parliament. This is, you know, I said I nearly fell off the wheel, and I did. The good thing about that was I was relieved to, to know that I wasn't the only one. And so, that sort of made me feel a lot better. And, um, and the other thing, the, this ARC, ARC Resource Collective, I sort of call it Centre for some reason, um, yep, it's been going for 40 years this year, and the politicians, I think he's left the planet, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, next slide. Right. Uh, some of the slides don't relate too much to what I'm saying, but um, I've got to get back to talking about glaze. Um, yeah. And I don't know why Jane asked me to talk about glaze because, as she know, I've really only just started. Even though it's been 50 years, I've just started. Um, I've always had... I need to interrupt and say, you said, I don't know why, because I've had nothing but failures. And I said, but that's precisely what we want to hear about. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps. And how you navigate that. Yeah, well, maybe it's not. Maybe. We all have failures. Yes. So I've had always, from the beginning, a love-hate relationship with glaze. It never seemed to work for me. So I never used it. I put it on the inside of pots for a liner, and I always had the raw glaze finish, and we lived off that, with no glaze on the outside. And then I sort of um, started to do some wood firing, because I knew that with wood firing, you didn't have to glaze. Well, that was the idea. And um, so I, I did that for a while, and, and studied under Eno and, and, and Owen. And um, when I'd finished doing my degree, or whatever you call it, it was, a, it was a graduate diploma. I didn't do a diploma because that was three years. I looked at it and thought, oh, graduate diplomas, one year I can do that. I didn't know at the time you needed to actually do the diploma today and do the graduate diploma. And so, because I was ignorant, the bluff sort of got me through and they accepted me, so it was, yeah. So, um, now, uh, then, I finished that, got the degree, picked up the degree, off I went, and I had a gap. Something sort of happened and I stopped for 20 years. I don't know why. But four or five years ago, 
I sort of picked it up again. Next slide, yeah. This is sort of no glaze pot, and just left out it side. And Owen Rye actually told me that secret. Just leave your pots outside for two or three, five years, and then they'll de develop on their own. So that's, that's that. And then the next one is just a wood fire, just from the wood fired time. Not much ash on that. So you did, that was probably only fired for 24 hours. So that sort of worked. So I went from there and then uh, the other day, you might have seen this photograph because it seemed to go what I thought was feral, but apparently somebody told me it was viral. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I, I, I came out at four o'clock the other morning and uh, there was a koala sitting next to the kiln. And I hadn't seen one there before. We hear them now and again. And oh, there he was. Uh, so, so I better talk about Shino. Perhaps. And everyone probably knows here it was developed in Japan. Well, that's what I've read. Uh, as a white glaze. <laughs> we, we never had internet. We didn't even have a telephone when I started. So you didn't have any information. But so I'm getting there's an internet, you know. I don't get it off Facebook, but it's sort of close. Yeah, so it's a glaze breaks to, to orange where it's thin and usually white, so maybe we go to the next one, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. But as you can see, uh, it can develop a lot of faults. Yeah, so to some people, certain attri attributes of the glaze look like mistakes, but to connoisseurs, like us, um, yeah, it's, it's unique, interesting, and uh, it's a feature. And it's a dollar extra, and it's, um, yeah, it's beautiful. And but it takes time, a bit of time to sort of get the hang of that because you sort of don't want it to begin with. And then you realise, hang on a minute, without that, it's, it's not as good. Well, I started using porcelain to begin with, with because I thought that had developed the chino really well. Uh, but it seemed just a bit too safe. So I jumped on to... Um, oh, yeah, the next, the next one is the porcelain one. Yep, I'll keep going. Oh, yep, 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 yep. I'll, I'll keep going. I'll I can jump over. I kept going, and um, I, what came to my head was the words of Owen or, or Eno or Headley uh, saying, why make a pot that can be made easily out of a machine? You can buy it for a dollar in Kmart. Why, why, why do that? Because we're all trying to be perfect if we can, you know. And um, uh, they're a little bit too perfect for me now. And that's a Shino glaze. We'll jump to the next one. And they're also Shino, and I've got that pot. This came out green, and I've, it's the only pot I've got that's chino green. I use the same way, so green, but this is sort of what also happens, and if you can see inside, the crawling can not be so good. But I love the pot on the outside, but uh, it's a battle. Okay, so we'll jump to the next one. What is it? Uh, just a bit of the variation. I won't be able to jump this, it's good. And that's, yeah, the, and that jumped out at me too. Uh, glory and gory, very closely connected. So, um, and so that's a different one. That's sort of sort of okay on the outside. Yeah. But inside just, and, and I get way worse than that, I have had. And so then we'll jump over to the next one, and because you can trap carbon um, in, in the glaze when you're doing a, a chino, heavily reduced chino thing, which sounds really cool and sort of up to now sort of thing. But I've never really been able to push that because I could be questioned about what else we're doing to the planet. Yeah, so but that's, that's sort of a fine example. Um, okay, we'll jump to the next because I know we're finishing up. We end up with, with this sort of statement, another verse of the same Dylan song that seemed to ring true as well to me in that doesn't matter where you are, top, bottom, middle, sideways, you know, you, it's just a matter of perspective where you where you think you are. Um, oh, that's good thing. I'll jump. You did it. And we just got in as the music's starting up. But um, thank you, Trevor. That was awesome. That was fantastic. No, it is because. Um, it, you know, and I've got a Shino, a Shino pot at home, which was the very first pot that I ever saw from Japan and inspired my journey with ceramics. Not that I do Shino, but it is crawled just like yours, 
and it was made by a very, very famous potter. So, you know, there you go. So it's nothing to be. <laughs> it is a journey, and I love the Dylan quotes, and, you know, it's fantastic. Um, do we have some questions from the audience? We will repeat them. So if you can say who they're for, and then they'll repeat the question and then have an answer. Where are you based, Trevor? They're still trying to I was trying. Look, I, I mentioned to a friend that was perhaps, perhaps a little more conservative than I am what I was going to say. I was going to talk about this politician. It's a politician that he voted for. And he said, you don't want to make it political, you know, because some, some sides, maybe both sides of politics, they have, their skin's pretty thin. <laughs> so, so I've tried to get that. Well, it was Foster in South Gippsland. So it was a local Gippsland member. He's gone. The, uh, there's a, a beautiful gallery in Menion, and he's the, the, the original politician, another politician, well, same, similar name, first name, took over from him and opened the gallery, and I went to the gallery opening, and he was saying such fantastic stuff, it's only three or four or five years later, and I, ha I had to tell him about his predecessor, the words that he, he said, and so, anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> Any other questions? So that was Costa, the yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> One word. <laughs> Yes, Yasha. Uh -huh. Alexandra, if you went back in time, would you do anything differently? Uh, no, I wouldn't. No. Single word answer, too. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Anyone else? So you spray? I spray and then brush. Spray and brush? I, I've got some really good wine, you know, brushes that are about that wide, and I just put it on with a brush because a little bit of unevenness for me just adds to the character of it. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not aiming, if I was making something in a factory, I'd want a deeper tan and get it all even. But I'm not aiming at that, so it doesn't matter if it's a bit uneven. And Trevor, any tips? Yeah, microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Official, okay. Visual. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Another thing I just wanted to point out is that Alex, some of the the range of these three people, Alexander also mentioned that you buy commercial glazes sometimes and you paint them on, and that is. You know, we have this wealth of um, commercial glazes at our beck and call now, and we didn't when you started. So this is also um, a rich resource for us to use. It's nothing to be ashamed of that you don't mix your own glazes, you know, you can or you can't, you know. Thank you, everybody, so much. And please go and visit their stalls.